how quickly can you reformulate to deal with the South African strain? Well, good afternoon and good morning. So as you say, the UK strain has very high neutralizing antibody, the same as the strain we've seen so far, so we feel very good about it. We still feel that the South Africa strain has a very high level of antibody. It is actually higher than the level of antibody of people that have been naturally infected. So we believe it is protective right now. The thing that we don't know, and it's really unknowable scientifically for the next few months, is how this is going to look like midterm. I'm talking six months, 12 months, 18 months. We are not worried at all for the short term. But what you don't know, especially with the elderly, is how much the antibody is going to decay in their body. And because, as you say, the South Africa is a bit lower than the one in the UK or the one circulating the rest of Europe and the US, we want to be cautious. And so what we have done is we've announced this morning we are launching a new vaccine containing the strain first identified in the Republic of South Africa, the B1351. And that product is going to be in the clinic very quickly. Our goal will be to have it ready as a cautionary step. It might not be needed, but we cannot be wrong. We have to be sure if that becomes a problem in the fall to have a boost, a single dose to be given at least to people that are high risk like the elderly. And what is the manufacturing um, lineup when it comes to that booster? Like you mentioned the fall, what if they haven't received their initial vaccine yet? Like how, how does that happen in terms of distribution and then also in terms of uh, production for you guys? Yes, yeah, so the amazing thing about mRNA technology, it's a platform. And so it's the same chemistry for the mRNA molecule between the current one and potentially this new one. It is the same chemistry for the lipid we put around it. It's the same machine uh, that we use, the same people. So it's totally interchangeable, whatever we make. So our plan right now is to continue to make as many COVID-19 vaccines as authorized in the UK, US, and Europe uh, as we can to supply those countries. We are going to do the clinical experiment on the side so that we could be ready in late summer, early fall, if that strain was required, to basically switch the vaccine to the new one, again, for the boost. Because the boost could be a lower dose that will increase significantly our supply if that was the case. Stefan, as you say, from, an, from a messenger RNA point of view, the switch is a relatively straightforward one. From a regulatory point of view, is it the same? So it is, of course, a new path for all of us. If you look, I think there's a good template, which is what happened with seasonal flu. For seasonal flu, where, as you know, manufacturers have to go very quickly, regulatory agencies have agreed to look at antibody levels. And so you could see a world where we do very quickly a boost to the participant of a phase one of last year. If you recall, the phase one started on March 16 last year. So we're very close, able to dose those people with a boost, a single dose of that new strain. We're going to get a sense, do we need 25 or 50 or 100 microgram? I remind you, the current vaccine is 100 microgram. So we think we might be very good with a lower dose because the immune system is already primed. And then what we're going to do is we're going to do most probably a couple thousand participants in the phase three to boost those in the phase three. Because it's only a dose and because you can get the antibody within a month, you can see how the timeline can work very well to be ready for the end summer, early fall with this new strain, again, if it is required. Uh, you had mentioned that it, your current vaccine seems to be successful against the UK strain. What about the Brazilian variant? So this is being analyzed. So what we know today is the, the UK strain is exactly for our vaccine like the old strain. So there's no problem. People getting vaccinated are going to be as protected. And you know, uh, we got a 94% efficacy in our trial. So we feel very good about the UK. Again, South Africa, I want to remind people, works now very well. The question is, what will it look like in six or 12 months, especially in the elderly. The Brazilian strain is being analyzed. What we do is we follow all those mutations we have since last January of 2020. There's been a lot of mutations so far. They were not important. But now the virus, you know, is evolving. And the virus wants to survive. So as more and more people are infected, and as we're going to get more and more people vaccinated, the virus is going to keep on evolving, which is why we need to keep chasing it in case we need a new vaccine. 
You seem to be implying today, Stefan, that the antibody response um, is in some way correlated to efficacy. Is that the case? That is what we think now. I want to be cautious. It's a very good question. Because it's such a new virus, there is today no established correlate of protection. The best one we have seen is neutralizing antibody. We know from other viruses that neutralizing antibody is very important. But I don't think any of us can make a one-to-one -one comparison. It is just the best, the best tool that we have now to make scientific hypotheses. How important is it that you eventually know that so the next vaccine won't need a huge trial? Correct. It's very important that we learn that as a medical community. This is happening with the NIH and Dr. Fauci's team and the FDA and the collaboration across all the manufacturers. So we're going to get to a point where we have a correlate of protection. We just do not have it yet. But as we discussed, we're going to still be able in a matter of months to get a new variant of a vaccine in case it is needed in the fall. Is your best case assumption now, Stefan, that we will need a series of boosters? Is that the world we are now going to be living in? Is this going to be something that is going to become comparable, as you mentioned before, with seasonal flu? This is what we believe. We believe uh, SARS-CoV-2, because it's an mRNA virus, as you know, like the flu, mRNA virus are by nature physically unstable. They mutate very easily. DNA viruses like HPV or hepatitis are DNA-based virus, which is why, by the way, once you get infected, you're infected for life. The DNA never leaves your body, which is why they tend to lead to cancer in the long term. But the mRNA virus is gonna still evolving. It is so spread out now that I believe this virus is not going away. We're gonna to have to deal with it. I really believe that we have a technology to get there. So of course, getting to chase a new virus, usually you have years and years to develop a vaccine. Uh, it takes some time. Now we have a couple approved vaccines. So I really believe, and it will depend on the country, that a lot of countries are going to be immunized. Uh, and also, in addition, you have people naturally infected that are going to provide some mm -hmm. immunity to the virus for some time at least. But I really do believe that we're going to evolve to a seasonal boost where regularly, and I don't know yet the frequency, we're going to need to get a boost. But one of Moderna's plan is to merge that with seasonal flu. We've announced that we're going after a seasonal flu to have a much better product for seasonal flu. As you know, the seasonal flu vaccine don't work very well now. In a good year, in a 50 60%. In a bad year, in a 30% efficacy. But we believe, given the data we have seen with our mRNA platform, that the elderly will have very high efficacy in our seasonal flu vaccine. And so our idea is to develop seasonal flu, the COVID seasonal boost, to merge those into a single vial. Mm. So you could eventually need only one shot in the fall, and you'll get protected against flu, much better than today's technology, and against COVID, the current strain circulating. Something that's happening, though, in the here and now is that certain countries like the UK are lengthening the time between the two shots. Um, there's a conversation that if you do that, you're going to have more mutations of the virus. Can you talk me through that? So the situation we're all facing is that we are at war against this virus, and we have been for more than a year and going to keep lasting. Uh, as you know, we have a new strain identified first in the UK, B117. It is spreading faster. And as has been communicated last week, it might actually be more lethal. We don't know yet for sure. And so indeed, protecting people very quickly is important. The only data we have is a prime and a boost. Then you can imagine that the governments and public health uh, doctors have to make a decision, which is a very hard one, which is do I vaccinate people with prime and a boost on a short schedule, the one for which it has been approved, the one for which we have data? Or do we rely on immunology and vaccinology to decide to push out the boost a little bit so that we can protect faster and more people? That's a very tough one. And those are decisions to be made by governments, not by companies. We only can recommend what has been clinically tested. Stefan, can I just take you back to the answer you gave me just a moment ago about combining the, uh, the COVID-19 uh, vaccine in with the seasonal flu. One of the, one of the conversations that Alex and I have almost on a daily basis at the moment when we talk to healthcare professionals involved with the rolling out of vaccines is they have issue with the cold chain. 
you and I have spoken in the past about the idea that you may be able to reformulate to make the, the, your vaccine more stable at a higher temperature. Where is the progress uh, at the moment? Will this new booster jab, for instance, that you're talking about be more stable at a more elevated temperature? So it's a good question. And indeed, as we talked about before, we are investing heavily to improve the temperature condition. As you know, Moderna five years ago was like Pfizer today at minus 70 Celsius. As you know now, we're at minus 20, but then we have a month at 2 to 8 C in a regular fridge. We're keeping on pushing that. Our goal, and we will not stop investing in science until we get there, is to get to regular fridge temperature. We think it is technically feasible. It just requires a lot of work to get there. Uh, and we will update uh, the governments and the market when we, we are into a better place. But you need to be assured, we're going to keep pushing the science, like we've done in the past, to get this product stable for two years in a regular fridge, like regular vaccines. And we're going to get there. Uh, in the U.S., there's a huge conversation about the states not having enough of the vaccine, the majority of them obviously getting the Moderna vaccine. Um, wh where's, the, where's the issue? It, is it on the production side? Is it your conver it, What kind of conversations are you having with the government? Is it, it on the distribution side? Can you give me some insight as to where the actual problem and bottleneck is right now? Yes. So in terms of supply, we are exactly on plan to what we had told the U.S. government. We've given them a schedule for January, February, March, and December. We're exactly on track, and we're still on track to deliver 100 million doses by the end of March, as we've said recently. I looked at the CDC number this morning. Uh, there has been 41 million doses distributed by the federal government, the CDC, to the different states. You could assume around 50% of that is a Moderna vaccine. Uh, and what is reported as of last night on the CDC website is that 9.7 million of people got injected the Moderna vaccine. And so the piece that is not clear, but pretty typical, is that you have so many sites across the country. It's a typical supply chain problem, is that because there is not enough inventory, you have very strong demand, because, you know, the media has talked a lot about the anti-vaxxer or people that were worried, but I don't think what has been talked about enough is the line of people we cannot wait to get vaccinated and to get protected. We believe in science, we believe in the FDA, and want those vaccines. And so we have this problem now where we have an incredible demand for a vaccine across the state, a very distributed uh, vaccination site, as it needs to be, but then you have no stock. And so I'm sure right now there are some sites or hospitals that have still vaccines, but some of us we don't. And it's going to take a month or two to get to a place where there is enough vaccine so that at every vaccination site, people can get their boost on time. I know it's frustrating, but we should remember, usually it takes three to four years to build the manufacturing infrastructure to launch a vaccine. We've done that in less than a year. So we don't have yet full output, but every month we are getting more and more vaccine into the supply chain. And we are exactly on track to what we said to the US government several months ago.